I'll be talking about today, everyone's talking about machine learning, and I started getting into that area uh, two or three years ago now, um, started working with various people. And, and this presentation is, is really part of that story of moving, moving choice learning and machine learning towards uh, you know, a better future together. So if I start off, if you just a reminder of what we're actually doing when I talk about choice modeling and, and travel behavior I is we have, a, we have a real world context where you know, real people make choices, um, either real choices or hypothetical choices. Um, they make those choices in a certain environment. They use some choice process that we do not observe in the outcome. And everything that we do as choice modelers and also increasingly machine learning is the stuff in the blue box on the side where we try and replicate that kind of behavior mathematically. Uh, we train our models, or choice models tend to use the term, estimate model parameters on data. And then after we've trained our models and estimated parameters, we use them in application, okay? And we use them for a number of different reasons. We use them to maybe understand behavior. We use them to produce results that we can use in policy work and appraisal, so part of time measures, et cetera. Or we use them in forecasting, calculating elasticities, predicting what might happen in the future. And these different motivations and different outcomes really conflict and contrast with each other. So, you know, are we interested in reproducing current choices? I mean, in predicting what might happen in the future if there's better transport, a new transport policy, et cetera. Maybe we're interested in behavioral insights to really understand, well, who chooses what in what settings and how can we change their behavior? And then, of course, produce results that can be used by policy. And we, as choice models, are not alone in this interest in modeling mathematical behavior. Um, so I'll use these acronyms going forward. Choice modelists, uh, you know, largely with an academic uh, foundation, but also a lot of uh, engineering interest. Mathematical psychology, uh, which I will also refer to as process models, and then machine learning. And these three disciplines have very different interests in what they're doing. So too far away from the remote. Oh, maybe you can move me off. Okay. Ah, yeah, that one. Okay. So choice modelers are interested in why a choice is made. Okay. So we're interested in understanding, well, what happens if travel time increases or travel cost increases? We're interested in the influence of explanatory variables on behavior. Um, most of what we're doing is based in an economic uh, foundation, so rational types of behavior. We're also interested in departures from that. So looking at ideas from behavioral economics, um, looking at moving away from a purely rational model. Why do you use policy guidance? And then we always, or at least we should always accept that the models that we use are an approximation of real behavior. So we don't tend to say that our models represent what people really to. Process modeling, so this is in mathematical psychology, is much more interested in how is a choice made. So how do people actually evaluate the different options available to them and how they're reaching out of? So we've been working on various models there, um, accumulator models with preference accumulator over time, ideas from quantum uh, probability. These models are often very computationally burdensome and they offer the additional data, EEG data, eye tracking. And then, of course, everyone. Should we begin? Ah, here we go. Everyone is now talking about machine learning. And you know, to, to put it simply, what machine learning are very really interested in is the outcome of the choice. So, they're not really thinking about how do people make choices or why do they make choices, but just what is the outcome of that choice process. Uh, now, these models can be used in very complex data, they're often more computationally tractable than our traditional models, but also um, traditional choice models, people in psychology really see these as black box tools where we have no idea what happens under the hood. So, if you contrast these three approaches to what the strength of 
what I've, what I've done here is that the middle is bad. Yeah, it's, uh, this is good. You see, I'm fine. It's the only one that ever looks right to the middle as being bad. But what I'm trying to convey with this picture is that none of these approaches is clearly the best overall. Okay. So machine learning is great at data source flexibility, great at prediction and validation, but then behavioral realism is an interpretation of policy rather than outputs is what we're really struggling with. So what I'm trying to do in my body of work um, is to move away from what's been happening, which is to just, you know, essentially compete between these, these different models uh, to try and build bridges to bring them together. Now, of course, before we can do that, we really need to understand the difference and understand which models work well for what kind of reasons. So the first study I'm going to talk about is work I did with Alan Solaridis and Thomas Hancock in Leeds, which is the first comparison of choice modeling, machine learning, and mathematical psychology models on the same data. So there's been many papers that have compared you know, two of these three on the same data, but none that's looked at all three. Stefan, come a little closer to the mic. I can turn this one on. <laughs> Thank you. And this one. Is that better? Let's right. See. Um, so what we're doing is we're using uh, logic models, mixed logic models for choice modeling, mathematical psychology, we're using decision tilt theory, including mixtures thereof, um, quantum choice models, again, including mixtures to account for heterogeneity, and in machine learning, we're using uh, bootstrap decision trees, random forests, and artificial neural networks. Now, I've only got an hour minus time for questions, so I'm not going to go into the details. Uh, of each one of these. The data that we're using uh, is a GPS data set that we collected in Leeds in 2015, 2016, 2017, where people were given a smartphone app on their phone that tracked them for two weeks. So for two weeks, it was tracking every time they were moving, then it was asking some questions about, well, you know, where is it that you are here? Why did you go there? How did you get here, etc. And what we're doing in this study we're using data from 540 individuals tracked over two weeks, and we're looking at their mode choice behavior. So we're looking at their trips, and we're trying to model what mode, what is the mode they're using for each trip. Then, um, especially, you know, choice modelers very rarely do model validation. And, and when we do, we tend to just say, well, we use a certain part of the data for estimation, a part of validation. Machine learning is much better at this, so they spend a lot of a lot of effort on this. So what we're doing here, we're doing two different ways of doing this. We're first splitting the data, 70 and 30 percent, very traditional, random split these two samples. But then we're also doing a different type of validation, where we're splitting the data into short and long trips. And then we're we're using hit rates, which is a traditional approach that they use in machine learning literature to compare models. In the paper, we're also looking at average prediction probabilities. The findings are actually the same. And then we're looking at elasticities as well. So first of all, if I'm comparing bagging against choice modeling of mathematical psychology, so the, the, here I'm looking at MNL and DFT as two representative models in choice of mathematical psychology. They perform exactly the same. Okay? The black solid line is on the estimation sample. The dotted line is on the validation sample. They're pretty similar. So we're losing a little bit by looking at the validation data, by, but not much. Now, if we're looking at the back decision trees, the red line at the top, a whole lot better than the choice models or the mathematical psychology models. But when we're now looking at validation, we're losing a lot. So there's a lot more overfitting than the choice models, and they become much closer to each other. Um, the same thing happens with random forests, and then the, um, with neural networks, which is <laughs> you know, the thing that choice models are most familiar with in a machine learning context. What we're seeing there is that if I'm increasing the complexity of the neural network by increasing the number of neurons, then the overfitting becomes worse, and eventually on the validation data, actually, the choice models outperform the, the neural network. So that's on the 70-30 split, okay? Um, where the data generating process of the two subsets of the data is very similar. So what happens if I split the data now into short and long trips? If I train the models on the short trips and I validate them on the long trips? Well, then 
on the choice modeling and, and mathematical psychology models, I lose more in validation than before, which I'd expect because now I'm forecasting not just outside the sample, but I'm forecasting outside the distribution. But you can see that the machine learning models now drop below the choice models in prediction which is what people talk about, but don't really illustrate very much. Uh, the same thing happens with random forests. And if I look at neural networks, it becomes even worse. So, you know, once again, the, the picture here is that in estimation, all three machine learning methods perform better than the choice modeling and mathematical psychology methods. But once I look at forecasting out of the distribution, they perform worse. Okay. Now, Clearly, forecasting out of distribution is something that we're keenly interested in when we're doing policy work and we're looking at forecasting the future. So later on, I'll have a I'll have a solution to this problem. And then, if we're looking at elasticities, this is where the story gets a little bit more worrying still. So the the green dot and sorry, my laser didn't work. So the green dot and the blue dot up here are the DFT model and the MNL model. They're pretty similar. And if you're looking at the, all the other dots are different machine learning models and you know all the red dots are the neural networks with different numbers of neurons. And what you can see here is that on the horizontal line, I got prediction accuracy, vertical line, I got the elasticities, they go a bit all over the place, okay? So this to me is not surprising, but it's also worrying. So what's happening here is that the machine learning models work really well at replicating current behavior but they're not necessarily giving us meaningful results where we're looking at, well, sensitivities and forecasting the impact of changes. So once again, in the last paper we're gonna talk about, we have a solution to that problem. Okay, so, so far, there's nothing surprising. So, so far, this is doing exactly what our suspicions are a priori, that the more behaviorally grounded models maybe perform slightly less well in estimation, but lose a lot less when it comes to uh, prediction performance, especially if we're predicting outside the distribution. So if we're looking at forecasting longer trips um, using what was estimated for shorter trips. So the second um, paper, so this is now work not with, with people in Leeds, uh, it's work with Shen Hao Wang, Wang, and Jin Hao Zhao. So Shen Hao um, was at MIT at the time, um, doing just finishing his PhD in a postdoc, he's now in Florida. Where we're going much wider, we're comparing hundreds of different machine learning and choice models uh, in prediction. Uh, and you know, this is how can we compare all of these models against each other? And you know, this was Shakar's idea, this brilliant idea, is to implement a meta tournament. So we're getting these models to compete against each other in a tournament. Now, how does this work? So we have m different models, so I've got an index of these different models. I know, let's say, x star m is the intrinsic predictive value of model m, okay? So this is how well, how, how good is this model at predicting choices? And we're now saying, well, this ability of this model to predict choices depends on what family of models that model belongs to. So is this a choice model? Is it a random forest model? Whatever. Plus, the characteristics of the study in which we're doing this. So maybe it's easier to predict mode choice than trip generation. Maybe it's more difficult to make predictions when there's more alternatives to choose between. So we use 105 models from 12 model families. Oh, the other thing that uh, Z includes is also the specification of the model. So the number of neurons, for example, uh, that we're including. Then, how does the tournament come into this? Well, each observation now in our data is a comparison of a pair of models. So let's say M0 and M1, not necessarily estimated on the same data. Uh, we're looking at, well, the probability of model M0 now winning this comparison is the probability, we're gonna just put this into a logic model, of the intrinsic prediction value for M0 being better than that for M1. And then we use many such pairs of comparisons in our model to now estimate the parameters that I showed you on the previous slide. So we used uh, data from the literature, 35 studies going back many years, 
think David Yost was one of the first ones a long time ago that's also in this study. So they compare machine learning and choice block. Then new data, models estimated on RP and SP data, 105 different models that we don't further segment by doing this on different sample sizes. And then what we're including is the choice context, the sample size, amongst others, and the choice context we're looking at, mode choice, power relationship, and trip purpose. So first, if we're looking at how are these different model families perform, um, you can see that um, if I rank them, your choice modeling is somewhere in the middle. Deep neural networks are the best overall, but you can see for each model family, there is a lot of heterogeneity in how well they perform on different data sets in different studies and so on. So that's the purpose of the tournament model is now to understand what drives this heterogeneity and what might inform which model maybe works better in what setting. Um, if we're now looking more specifically at 105 different models, I highlighted three in red here, nested logit, multi-memory logit, and mixed logit. Mixed logit is the worst, and I'll get back to that later on in another study. John and I already had a conversation about this uh, on Monday as well, that mixed logit maybe is not uh, performing the way people might naturally expect it to perform. But again, you can see a lot of heterogeneity. So then putting these into the tournament model, so we've got two groups of models, models on the literature data, models on our new data, and each time models with constants only, so just understanding well, which model family maybe overall performs better, uh, and that's where you can then see, um, for example, here, bagging has the most positive parameter in the literature uh, model. And then when we're adding the contextual effect, we're getting a much better performing um, matter tournament model. So that is telling us that the contextual effects matter a lot in explaining which model works better in what setting. Okay, so it matters where the study was, what is the, the type of choice that you're looking at, a uh, number of alternatives, sample size, and input direction. Okay, so many of the machine learning models, though not all, are performing the choice models, but the contextual factors matter much more here than the type of model. Okay? Um, now, here, the contextual factors were not separated by model type. So that's what we're working on at the moment, is to understand, well, maybe it is the case that mode choice, for example, some models work better on mode choice than others, while in trip generation, other models work better. Once again. Okay, so that's all been about comparing models against each other. So then, two years ago, Sandra and I started working, Sandra von Kahnberg in Delft, started working out, well, how can we bring these models together now? How can we combine the insights from different models into one? with a view to improving our prediction performance, and especially our out of distribution prediction performance. And we're doing this via model averaging. So model averaging is an approach that's used very widely in machine learning, but it's an approach that's mainly used to combine different models together. But what we're doing here is different. We're doing this to understand how these different models should be combined depending on where you're forecasting. So depending on how far away you're going from the estimation sample, which model should you be giving more weight to? Use the same data that I've already talked about uh, just now, divided into 80% for estimation, 20% for validation. But then in addition, we're dividing it into 10 segments by distance. So each of the 10 segments covers 10% of the distance distribution. Segments 1 and 10 are not used in estimation at all. So they're completely kept for validation. They're very short trips and they're very long trips. And all we're doing is something that might a priori sound a bit strange. We then use five sets of data in estimation, always combining four segments. So we're estimating a model on segments two to five, so the shorter types of trips, three to six, et cetera, up to six to nine, which is the longer trips. And then we bring in this together in model averaging to understand, well, depending on where we're predicting, which model should we be giving more weight to? Again, we use 
a number of different models. So um, logit models with constant, most specific time ahead of vehicle time, log transfer with continuous attributes, nested logit models, random regret, decision field theory, mixed logit, and then two machine learning models, multi-layer perceptron, which is a neural network, and gradient boost. So the first thing is about mixed logit. So mixed logit in estimation is the best, okay? So this is the log likelihood per observation in estimation. Mixed logit is the best, which is what we see on data when we do this. And mixed logit is the worst in application. Now we all use mixed logit all the time to capture heterogeneity, um, you know, travel time sensitivity, travel cost sensitivity. But the point is the reason that works well in estimation, we have multiple observations per person, we're seeing multiple choices for that person, then we integrate over a distribution. The point is in forecasting, we again need to integrate, i.e. average across the draws, and we're losing that example, that advantage completely. Okay? So the forecasts for mixed logit are really no different, and in this case, actually worse than what we're seeing from MNL. Otherwise, the two machine learning models are uh, much better than the, the choice models. So gradient boosting is almost always the best out of our model. So this is the, the performance versus gradient boosting with the, um, the only four cases here, there are four cases where the multi-layer perceptual model performs better than the gradient boost. There are two cases where it performs better. Um, you can also see that the advantages become even larger on longer trips. So if we're predicting longer trips, and actually we is do it much better. Now, the real question is, how well do these models now perform in out-of-distribution prediction? So let's say we've estimated a model on short trips, segments two to five. How well are those models going to do to predict segment one, so the very short trips, or segment six, seven, eight, nine, the longer trips. And will the performance degrade as we move away from the estimation segment? Now what I've got here is models estimated on segments two to five, and I'm looking at how well did it predict. So this is what the data shows that, okay? And what we can see is they predict segment one actually a little bit better than the area in which they've been estimated because very short trips are pretty easy to predict here. But then as I'm moving away, you can see that here, especially DFT, really struggles. On the other hand, if I've estimated our models on longer trips, so again, looking at the other extreme, segment six to nine, the neural network is terrible when I predict how well, you know, how does it predict the very short trips? So you can see clearly here, we have difference across different models in what they do in out of distribution prediction. So, what we then do is we use model averaging. So we use the characteristics now of the, uh, of the segments to determine what weight we're going to give to the models. So how far are we going away from the estimation data that determines what weights we're giving to the different models just in a model averaging project. So we've estimated all of these models and then we're estimating a model averaging structure where the P's are now given and we're just estimating the weights that we're assigning to these different models. And so what we do is we estimate constants for the different models. So I've removed mixed logit from here because mixed logit never gets any weight in prediction, which is in line with what I told you earlier. And then we're looking at the impact of distance below the segment and distance above the segment. Okay? So this means that if we're trying to predict a trip that's within the distribution on which the models were trained, all that will matter is these constants but then once I go below and above, then the distance matters as well. So first of all, if we're sticking within the segment, you can see the neural network gets moved of the weight. Um, you can see that the nested logit actually gets a fair bit of weight too. Okay? If I go and predict shorter trips, so trips that are shorter than the data on which I've estimated it, and what I mean shorter is like, shorter than the minimum distance of any trip in my data, then you can see almost all the weight goes to the multi limit logic model. Okay? That's reassuring means we've been doing something right all those years. If I predict longer trips, it's a bit different. Now that's just 
averaging out, but I can also look here at how the weights change as a function of the distance that I'm looking at. And you can see here, if I'm going um, far below, so at least I've got, at first I've got the logic model getting a lot of weight, and then over here, I'm giving a lot more weight to the logic model. Okay, so the nested logic model gets a lot of weight for predicting very short trips, trips that are much shorter than what I've estimated for the model. And if I, go, if I go above here, then you can see, again, MLP here decreases the further I go away. XGB stays pretty flat. But actually, suddenly here, the decision theory model suddenly starts getting a lot of weight if I go far above the distribution. And if I now look at this in validation, then overall model averaging now does the best as expected. So it combines all of these different models together and it uses the relative advantages and disadvantages depending on where it is I'm predicting. Okay, so um, most of the overfitting tests have looked at random validation samples. Here we're seeing that the performance of the models depends on where it is that we're predicting. Are we going below or above the distribution? And what model averaging allows us to do is then use all of the models together and give different weights depending on where we're predicting. Okay, so final study, how many do you have for time, John? Can you do another five or six minutes? I'll be quick. Okay, so the last one is the most interesting one because the last one is trying to, so this is a very long list of authors, um, C.G. Fang is now with Ricardo Desiano, Cornell, Ruyao, Tim Brathway, John Walker, who many of you will know, and again, Shanghao Wang. So what we're doing in this work is recognizing that most machine learning models do really well in prediction, but they don't have a behavioral foundation, and hence they might lead to results that are not in line with economic theory, okay? And specifically um, that they might not predict that demand goes down as cost goes up. So what we're doing here is we're using a constraint optimization framework to enhance the regularity of these models, so the behavioral regularity of the models. So what is behavioral regularity? Well, what we're looking at here is if we're looking at the uh, partial derivative of the probability against an attribute, let's say cost, okay, we integrate that over the distribution of social demographics or whatever else in our data, and then we're looking at, you know, is this always going to be negative, okay? So as cost goes up, for example, as travel time goes up, does the probability, the demand go down? We can have strong regularity so that you know, epsilon here is zero, so that it needs to be negative, or we can use an epsilon that's, you know, a small positive number so that we allow for some violations of this. We can approximate the integral by averaging across the people in our sample. So now the question is, how can we make use of this in the estimation of a neural network? So the way neural networks are, are estimated is that we have a set of hyperparameters, you know, how many layers, how many neurons, and then the neural network learns the parameters W by minimizing the cross entropy L, and that's you know equivalent to likelihood maximization. So you know, we have to sum across people, alternatives, look at whatever is chosen, and so on. So that's an unconstrained estimation. Um, now what we're doing is we're now introducing behavioral regularity. We're saying, well, what we want to do is minimize L, which is the same as maximize the log likelihood in the choice modeling context. And we're saying subject to this condition R, so subject to regularity, so subject to there being decreasing probability as the cost goes up. Now, what we're doing is instead of having hard constraints on estimation, we use soft constraints. So we're adding here, so we're not minimizing just L, but L plus lambda, which is the, the strength of the constraint that we're imposing, and the sum across all of the people, again, of that uh, constraint. And then we're looking in the paper at various different ways of doing this to regularize the, the gradient of utility of the probability or of the log likelihood. Okay, we use here, in the paper, we use a number of different uh, data sets. Here I'm using the My Daily Travel Survey data from Chicago. So again, this is a revealed preference data set um, looking at mode choice. 
And here I'm just using a sample size of 10,000 and the paper also looking at the input of using smaller sample sizes. So first, if you're looking at the um, neural network here, so unconstrained, so just this second column, not likely is better than the MNL model. Um, accuracy is the hit rate, where once again, it's better. But then if you're looking at regularity, you know, my logic model here, cost coefficients are negative, time coefficients are negative, so purely rational behavior. Whereas if we're, let's look at strong regularity, the neural network only means that at the rate of 0.67. So this would be troublesome if we now use this model in prediction for policy work. If we're now using regularization, which is something I talked about on the previous slide, we're losing a little bit of log likelihood. So this is not log likelihood in estimation. This is log likelihood on the validation data. In the estimation data, of course, losing more by constraining it, but we're not losing a lot. And actually, in two cases, the hit rate increases, but we're getting the behavioral rationality back into our models. Okay? It's still not 100%, and I'll talk about that on the next slide. So if you're looking at what the MNL model does in prediction, if we're looking at driving costs increasing, the probability for car goes down, the probability for the other modes increases. But if I look at the neural network without any constraints applied to it, you can see that impact is much weaker. And depending on where I'm looking at, it increases. Once I impose the regularization, I get the behavior that we would expect. Now, this comes at a cost, of course. You know, if you impose any constraints in estimation, you are going to eventually lose some prediction quality. And what we're saying here, this relates to lambda, which is this parameter, the penalty that we're applying in the model, okay? So here I'm using the lower lambda, but the larger I make lambda, the more I penalize the model for these violations of regularity. And what we can see is that, you know, obviously the stronger I'm making the penalty, the blue and green line approach one, okay? Um, so the, um, yeah, the green and blue line go up. So that's the regularity goes up to 100%. So the model now predicts rational behavior for everyone. But of course, I start losing model fit. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so you need to try and find this sweet spot. Well, you know, over here, for example, I am getting um, you know, 95% regularity of something. I'm not yet losing a lot of prediction performance. So it's a case of judging where is that line. Uh, okay, so this can really help improve the behavioral realism of the models. It is very easy to implement, okay? Um, so, of course, they still remain a black box, the model, but at least they remain a black box that gives us behaviorally meaningful results now. And then you need to make this trade-off um, between prediction quality and irregularity. Um, now, in the large sample, by making, imposing more regularity, we start losing more. Actually, what happens in the small sample scenario, the small sample scenario is the regularity is very helpful in reducing overfitting on the estimation sample. So conclusions, um, machine learning is very powerful. Uh, choice models should you know, kind of move away from the idea of seeing this as an existential threat and maybe seeing it more as an opportunity. Um, that I don't think behavioral models are going to go away anytime soon. But the, uh, the point now is that we can use these models together. In prediction, we can combine the models together. We can also impose some behavioral regularity onto machine learning algorithms to help us make them more realistic and help us better understand what happens in the data, and especially with very complex data you will quickly realize the advantage of these models in helping you understand their behavior in the data.